All right, welcome everybody. Man, we've been looking forward to this one for a while. Uh, you're with the Civil War Trust at Fre Fredericksburg 155 Live. I'm Gary Edelman. I'm Chris White. And we're with the Civil War Trust. We've also got Connor Townsend behind the camera helping with social media. Dan Davis, Emerging Civil War uh, filming. That's his nod here. We're happy to have Don Fonz back again, uh, formerly of the National Park Service, wrote a book on Yule. Let's go down the line. We have an entourage, Best Part Nixa and, uh, and Pete Mogul, uh, Frank O'Reilly, all of the National Park Service, as you can well see from the National Civil War Museum. We've got Wayne, we've got Dane, we've got Brett, and they've got cool stuff with them. We've got Chris Mikowski, who is now up to 4,200 books he's written on the Civil War, 1,800 of which were written during these Facebook Lives, and we're really happy you could come back. Man, do we have a lot to talk about. I think, Chris White, you're going to take it away and talk about what's right behind you. Yeah, we're going to talk for just a minute, and we'll bring Beth in, uh, talk a little bit about this great battle painting that's uh, behind me. If you've been to Fredericksburg, you've gone on one of the great walking tours, check out their website. Make sure that you can see when they have their walking tours, when they're in season, and it's not 19 degrees out here. They'll be happy to show you around. But this is one of the battle paintings. You may have seen a number of battle paintings around Fredericksburg if you've come here by Sidney King, a uh, great, fairly local artist. And you're standing down here at this gold star that says, you are here. And this gives you a great overview of what Fredericksburg would have looked like in 1862. But unfortunately, it doesn't show you the entire battlefield at Fredericksburg. Where we've been this morning is kind of left off of the rest of this map. So we're going to talk about one portion of the battle today, or this afternoon, and that's the Sunken Road, the Maurice Heights sector, that very famous sector, the Irish Brigade, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, uh, Thomas Cobb, and some others. So Beth, let's come on over here, and Beth's going to help bring us up to where we are. And since Beth wasn't with us this morning, we've talked Prospect Hill, we've talked Slaughter Pen Farm, what's the next thing we should talk about at Fredericksburg? Well, the other half of the battle. So. Uh, we're here right along the Sunken Road at the base of Murray's Heights. Uh, probably the most famous portion of the battle takes place right here. So you've got the context um, talking about the southern end of the field, really the point of the battlefield in which Ambrose Burnside had a real chance at success. But here, um, a lot of folks would say that the Union forces never really had a shot. Uh, they're attacking a very strong Confederate position that you can see here uh, at the base of Murray's Heights with the infantry down in the road with a perfect uh, built-in barrier of a stone wall. And then uh, these positions up here on the Heights Artillery uh, with a perfect range on this wide open field that extends for probably a half a mile out in front of us. The town itself, which now comes right up to our doorstep in the National Park, uh, at that time only extended for about a half a mile out of the river. So you've got a mile of ground to cross if you're a Union soldier, and your job is to assault these heights. Now, down at Prospect Hill, you probably heard that, again, that's the militarily crucial part of the battlefield. That's where you really have a chance at success. But for these commanders, the orders that they're given lead them to believe that their attack is every bit as important. So they attack with the idea, we're going to capture these heights. The problem is, again, the Confederate defense, the wide open plain out in front, and you're gonna have a really uh, serious struggle to try to actually attack these heights. And I think a lot of you all know that, uh, you know, it doesn't look like this anymore. We're gonna try to get out uh, 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 over to some of that area so you can see what we're talking about. Take us over there, Chris. Yeah, let's take a walk over towards what's today Lafayette Boulevard. Uh, we would have called this uh, Prussia Street during the time of the American Civil War. Again, the city of Fredericksburg's founded in 1727, and all of that, the names of the streets from that time period come from the House of Hanover. King George II's house. And as we're looking out to this area in 1862, we'd be looking towards more open fields, but they wouldn't have been as open as they would appear. We would have uh, Mercer Square, which was the agricultural fairgrounds. Fredericksburg boasts one of the oldest, oldest agricultural fairs in the United States. You would have had some houses that would have sat out on this open plain. Off to the right, if Dan can pan off to the right, you'll see the small Jennings house. The Jennings house didn't quite sit there but the Jennings house would have been out on this open plain. You saw the Stratton house this morning. If you haven't, go back and watch that one. Then you would have some other nuances to the land. You'd have fences, but then you'd also have a runoff of the Rappahannock Canal that ran through here. This canal race, it's very famous, uh, and a very famous soldier is going to talk about that canal race, and many soldiers will. And I'm going to bring Frank up here to talk for a minute just exactly what this canal race would have been. What are some of the obstacles that these Union men would have been looking at out in this open field? You know, open void of most houses, most trees, most fences. But what you heard from Chris here is that there are indeed obstacles out here. And one of the most significant is a tiny little water course that brackets the backside of the city like a belt. 
Uh, there's a slack water canal on the north side of the town that helps. And they have this runoff that's about 15 feet wide. It's got about seven feet of depth to it, and it has about five feet of water in the bottom of it. The Union Army realized that that was going to be a problem right out of the gate and decided that they were going to drain it but they were only able to bring the water down to about three feet before it leveled off. So it was still a major obstacle. There's only three bridges across the mill race and the Confederates know exactly where all of them are. They have strategically picked up all the floorboards but left the stringers in place, just enough of an incentive to lure the Federals to a spot that they have zeroed in with their artillery. So this is not just an open battlefield, this is a prepared battlefield. Right. The unique thing about Fredericksburg is that the Confederates have literally staged the battlefield before there is a battle. They've been waiting for this opportunity and they were going to maximize that effort. This is really cool. First of all, welcome Mary Abro. It's not just Antietam, you like Fredericksburg too. Now Chris, we're out here with our friends from the National Civil War Museum. Bring us up to speed on why we're standing in this parking lot. So uh, Ambrose Burnside is going to make seven frontal assaults, essentially frontal assaults, against Murray's Heights, which we're going to go up to here in a few minutes. They're going to be human wave after human wave, starting with William Blinky French's division. Uh, Blinky from his squinting of his eyes. He's also called Old Rum Barrel. Uh, so Blinky's going to come out here. Same troops for you, Mary Abro, that attacked the sunken road at Antietam. And now we have more and more units that will add on to it. Because once Burnside commits here, he thinks that he can still win it down at Prospect Hill. He thinks the attacks are still taking place down there. And even after the attacks at Prospect Hill fail, he has to keep attacking out of the city in case those Confederates would come off of the heights and out into the field and obliterate those Union soldiers that are out there. One of those Union soldiers that stuck out there would have been placed, would have been sitting out near what is today, or what at the time we call a swale. Uh, this swale would have given the men a little bit of cover. The swale today sits along about Little Page Street, about 100 yards out in front of the sunken road. And we're going to look down the street. If you go back to our earlier Facebook Live, you'll see the swale. We're going to look down the street, Dan. And you're not going to be able to just quite see. you see a white car pulling out. And right about in that area would be the swale. We have a 7-Eleven that's down there today. You might be able to see the 7-Eleven sign. And down in this area will be a, a famous unit. And that will be the 20th Main Infantry. So now all of you Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain groupies, oh, come running out and, and start clapping your hands. Ooh, yeah, man, no man, Chris is getting real here. To his wife, Fanny. 62. Uh, 62, yes. A lot, of the, a lot of the history of the battle in here. The museum has 274 of Chamberlain's letters. 274 of them. And they've been edited and published in a book called Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, Life and Letters and that, by Osprey Press. This provides a description of all three days of the battle, December 11th, 12th, and 13th. The most vivid, descriptive, and poignant parts of the letter are the descriptions from the 13th. And and he mentions the burial of troops in the area, area uh, under the Aurora Borealis. The um, Northern Lights. Yeah, yeah. mentions that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. What, one thing I found amazing in here is, um, you know that uh, is that uh, he mentions in here what his sources are. So he's not only in the battle, but he talks about writing battlefield notes from which he right. wrote these letters, right. and then later he writes an account based on these letters. Does he not? That's right. That's right. That's right. So we know we know that he has we know that he has many accounts, you know, several accounts, and so this obviously is the first one based on these on these historic notes per, here. Perhaps his most known account is titled "My Story of Fredericksburg," appeared in Cosmopolitan magazine in December of 1912. All right, two quick questions, and then we're going to keep moving. Man, do we have a lot to cover. We're going to do Marie's Heights. We're going to do uh, the National Cemetery. We're going to do the Sunken Road. Is that blood on the letter, and was it the ghost of Chamberlain that interrupted the broadcast? I don't think that's blood on the letter. <laughs> no, I think it's part of a seal or something, probably. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Any comments on the ghost? Yeah. Let's go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it for you, Chamberlain fans. A, a fantastic piece. Thank you again to the folks at the National Civil War Museum. That's in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. If you're in Gettysburg, if you go up to the battlefield there, just take the drive up to Harrisburg. It's not that far. It's a great place to visit. So now we're going to head up towards Marie's Heights. I'm going to bring on Chris Mikowski, who's enjoying his uh, Wawa coffee. I was just going to say, if it was a warmer day, we would go get a Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain Memorial Slurpee because that is the most recognizable landmark on the battlefield. Unfortunately, most of the battlefield has been swallowed up. We talked earlier about all the open space that was between here and the edge of town. It's now a neighborhood, so it's a little difficult to understand and appreciate just how open that space was. Although 
I guess our time out on the Slaughter Pet Farm this morning really helped me appreciate open spaces today. Uh, <laughs> it was Indeed. pretty chilly. Um, so it does get a little difficult to really understand the layout, the topography. Fortunately, we're going to go up on the heights, so you still get a beautiful view. It's absolutely worth the walk up there, and that begins to allow us to evoke that sense of open space that the Union soldiers are going to have to cross. Yeah, and as we're heading up here, we're going to bring on Don Fawns. Don's up ahead here. Don is uh, literally wrote the book on the National Cemetery here at Fredericksburg, and we're going to end up in this National Cemetery, but before we do, I'm going to ask Don to give us a little teaser. Tell us a, just a little bit about the National Cemetery here at Fredericksburg. Well, Fredericksburg, of course, was at the very heart of the Civil War. As a result, there were a lot of Union and Confederate casualties here after the war. Uh, and so after the war, the War Department sent out groups of people to find these bodies, collect them, and bring them to one location where they could give them a proper burial. That spot turned out to be Maurice Heights here off to my right. Uh, so today there are 15,300 Union soldiers buried there from six different battlefields, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, plus North Anna River and Mine Run as well. It's an amazing place to come. The park every May does an illumination. They place uh, beautiful candles up through the National Cemetery with the help of the Boy Scouts and some other, and Girl Scouts and other local groups. So be sure to get down here on Memorial Day weekend to check that out. It's a fantastic event. And um, I think Wayne over here might have something else for us in store. Yes, I do, Chris, and we, th we think this is a fitting place to show this. This is an identification disc from a soldier, and you have to stay out of the light, maybe. We can get it in the light there. From the 14th Brooklyn Infantry Regiment that fought here at Fredericksburg, and I think it's appropriate to show it here at the National Cemetery, as Don was saying. Unfortunately, so many of these bodies unidentified at the time of the Civil War, and the Union and Confederate authorities did not issue these identification discs during the Civil War. If you wanted to have one of these, you had to have it privately made, or you bought it off a of sutler. This particular soldier, Frederick N. Saunders is his name. He's from Brooklyn, New York, and he enlisted in 1861, uh, fought here at Fredericksburg, was captured on July 1st at the railroad cut at Gettysburg, and then went out of the service in 1864, and what was his trade since he lived in Brooklyn, a sailor. He joined the Union Navy and he died in 1938 at 94 years of age. And he's buried in Long Island. Now I'm going to flip it over because it has a likeness of George McClellan, everybody's favorite Union general to hate uh, in, the, in, the, in the Civil War. And very, very interesting. The Sorry. 14th Brooklyn, they would have served down on the south end of the field, closer to where we were yesterday with John Pelham. Uh, again, it's a very poignant reminder that many of these men up in our National Cemetery here at Fredericksburg are unknown. And it would have cost about $12 to have one of these made at the time. And if you're a private soldier, you're making $13 a month. So that's a substantial amount of money to have one of these made. It is indeed. And by the way, you know, let's start walking again here. Thanks so much, Wayne. Super cool stuff. Again, I don't know how we can tell the story without it, but guess where we are? We are in the sunken road now. It doesn't look too sunken. We'll talk about that in a second, but we are on the Confederate line. So welcome. Here we are. We're going to walk along the sunken road. What's up with all the stuff about the sunken road? Is it sunken? Is it not? Why is it sunken? Well, I'm going to start off and then I'm going to turn it over to our Park Service friends. One of the most common questions is, is it sunken? Yes. Is the whole thing sunken? No. Just a very small portion of this road is actually sunken and we'll take a walk down to it. Uh, the building behind me, that is the Fredericksburg Battlefield Visitor Center. It was not a private home at the time. That was placed here by the Civilian Conservation Corps. That is uh, the construction of FVC as we call it. You can see the bookstore today, the carriage house. Then you can see the visitor center under construction here. So uh, some of the folks we have here with us, this is their office. Uh, and there's also a museum. There's a 22 minute orientation film, fantastic orientation film. And the wall that we're looking at is not original. This is built by the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, in the 1930s. Frank, Pete, anyone want to jump in and talk a little bit about the hey, refurbishment? Let's keep walking too. Yeah, sure. So a lot of people ask about, um, you know, this road and, and the sunken road was one small section of the longer telegraph road that all went all the way from Baltimore to Richmond. So a very heavily traveled thoroughfare. Part of the reason that it is sunken is all this erosion and traffic over the years that have kind of worn it away, almost like this rut. Um, and it kind of carved itself out of this ridge line that we're going to be going on. Um, that's going to play a big part in, uh, in repelling these Union assaults later on. 
Good, good. And uh, if I may, I want to bring Chris White up in here. We're going to, I said up in here. Uh, we're going to turn around and show you one of the more famous photos of the war because, again, we've been spending the last couple of days talking about December of 1862, the Battle of Fredericksburg. But there's another Battle of Fredericksburg associated with the Chancellorsville campaign. That is Second Fredericksburg. And before I show this picture, I think we need a little bit of a setup for that. Yeah, the Second Battle of Fredericksburg uh, is going to be fought on May 3rd of 1863. It's part of the Chancellorsville campaign. Chancellorsville campaign has really four major engagements within it in the Fredericksburg area. And one of the major engagements will take place on May 3rd. 22,000 casualties on that day, not including er, including 2nd Fredericksburg, the fighting near the Chancellorsville Crossroads, the fight at the Salem Church. And here, John Sedgwick is going to try to break through Robert E. Lee's rear guard. 10,000 Confederates or so under Jubal early. And what the Union Army couldn't do in, in December of 1862, they're able to do in May of 1863. It's the one bright spot for the Federal Army in the entire Chancellorsville campaign. And they probe both ends of the Confederate line, they can't get around, and Sedgwick realizes we just have to go straight up the middle. Now, of course, the Union Army's thinking, we tried this in December, it didn't work. But Sedgwick wasn't here at the time. He's going to try something innovative, he's going to position his men in a new type of column that's going to basically charge, sprint right up this hill, and try to break through in sort of a diamond-shaped formation. He's also got columns that are going to come straight up some of the side streets here that are going to get mowed down. But in the pause that follows after that, that diamond shape is going to make its assault and finally break through here where the soldiers weren't able to do it in December. It's going to be vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting here. Um, they say that the bayonet was used freely in the sunken road at that time. And then Federals are going to sweep up and get on top of the hill. There's a great picture from Harper's Weekly of the 6th Maine on top of the heights holding the flag. It's a moment of triumph in an otherwise dismal campaign. And, and I would just like to add, I mean, right after the Union swept up there, supposedly within 20 minutes of when it happened, photographer A.J. Russell is here that very day and records this incredible picture. And Maybe we can take it off in this direction here. You're familiar with it, one of the more iconic photos of the Civil War. You can see the dead and the debris of battle that just fell here. That structure in the distance, Chris? That's the Hall House. It was about a two and a half story wooden structure that just turned into Swiss cheese by the two battles. Okay, and this may or may not look like it did in 1862. I mean, the Confederates have had time to improve things and, and to maybe to dig this ditch here and whatnot, but you can see a wall that looks very familiar, very similar to the one that's been rebuilt uh, very close to this location here. So we have really good photographic resources, and I'm glad A.J. Russell, for one, was among the photographers that were actually here in 1863, as opposed to the following year when every photographer was here. Guys? Now, notice it's quarried stone, too. It's a very formidable wall. It's it's not just field stone. We'll see some instances uh, on other battlefields where farmers are picking up stones and making them. But this is quarried stone, so it's an incredible defensive position that was ready-made for the Confederates when they got here. Yeah, the stone that was actually used in the stone wall around here was uh, also used in the construction of some of the Capitol building up in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. It's an extinct quarry, unfortunately, uh, which we'll have our National Park Service friends talk a little bit about when we get to the new section here in a second. That's Frank, which one of you guys want to come up and talk about the new section of the wall? And again, the well, section that's right behind us is the CCC section. We're coming up to the reconstructed section in a second. Exactly. The stone wall is one of the most essential parts of the entire story of Fredericksburg. And yet, when it came to remembering the battlefield, there was very little stone wall left to tell the story. So people had a tendency to create or recreate. The wall that we're going down along now is the first expression of remembering this stone wall. This was built by the CCCs at the same time that they were building the visitor center. But the problem is they didn't know what the stone wall looked like and I don't really think they cared very much either. So they just built themselves a stone wall. It doesn't look anything like what we would have seen in 1862. Over the course of time and the National Park Service taking a little bit more deep consideration, we decided that we were going to restore the entire length of the stone wall as it was in 1862. But we weren't just going to create any stone wall, we wanted to create the stone wall. So using archaeology, using ground penetrating radar, looking at photographs and sketches, we were able to recreate the stone wall as it appeared in 1862. This is a recreation right behind me, but this was done in 2005. This is the type of wall that the soldiers of 1862 would have understood, recognized, and would have used.
Yeah, and let me just say again, you are watching Civil War Trust Facebook Live 155 here at Fredericksburg. Thanks for joining us. We filmed all day yesterday. We've been shooting this morning. A lot of the questions that are coming up about looting and other, we covered when we were in the town yesterday. Go see those videos on our Facebook page, Civil War Trust Facebook. Look for the more recent videos and enjoy. You can still comment on them and enjoy. We'll do our best to get to, back to your questions. Um, and thanks for joining us. And thanks to the National Park Service for this entourage we have with us today. And the unfettered access we're really enjoying today. Um, Chris or whomever you may designate, we gotta, we want to get into some fighting. What actually happened? Well, I'm going to ask one question of Frank. Isn't the story true that whenever the Park Service built this wall, that it looked too pretty and that uh, the the chief historian, John Hennessy, might have had them take it down and beat it up a little bit? <laughs> you know, it's a crazy story, but the craziest part is it's true. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, we had a drywall conservatory come in here and recreate this wall for us. But he was so good at his job, he made a perfect wall. Now, when we came out and looked at it, it was beautiful, but it didn't look like the historic sunken road. So we had to come back and have him look at photographs, look at the wall he had created, and he finally articulated the difference. He said, let me get this straight. You want me to do it wrong? And we said, even better, we want you to make it look wrong but we want your wall to last where theirs didn't. <laughs> so they did rough it up a little bit. They made the top a little bit more uneven. This fella did a, just a superlative job. And this is what the 1862 soldiers would have recognized. This is just what you remember from some of our other Facebook lives with uh, the Mary Thompson doghouse at General Lee's headquarters at Gettysburg, where in the photos you see a two-bit backbeat slipshod bargain basement, really shoddy doghouse. And they went and built us a beautiful doghouse and we took power tools to it and beat that thing up to make it beat up and wrong. So sometimes you gotta do that. Gary, uh, Jerry Holmes says, hollowed ground, that road should be closed to through traffic. And indeed this did used to be open to through traffic. But when the wall was reconstructed, and they did the archaeology around this area. The, the city turned the road over to the Park Service, so it has been closed down. It's been resurfaced to protect the original roadbed. So there's a gravel road that's here, a little higher than it would have been at the time because of the covering, but it is closed to traffic. So now people can get out here on this hallowed ground and really experience it without worrying about getting run over by traffic. We Good. agree with you 100%. Good. Absolutely. Let's get into the fight, y'all. we yep. got lots to cover. So we're, we're moving down into a break in the stone wall. Uh, if you're here on December 13th of 1862, you'd be surrounded by Georgians. They're commanded by a, a firebrand lawyer from the state of Georgia named Thomas Reed Roots Cobb. Cobb is going to move his brigade of Georgians down into this road to utilize the stone wall. He's going to establish essentially a headquarters out on the wrong side of the wall in the home of a lady named Martha Stevens. Uh, she also goes by the name of Martha Farrow and Martha Ennis. She's a lady what we might call ill repute prior to the war. Uh, she was running an illegal bar out of her home. There is a story that the White House down below was running an illegal brothel. That's a story. I haven't seen any substantiation to those rumors. What kind of place is this? This keeps coming up, Chris. Uh, it's Fredericksburg. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, uh, have some great... Uh, documentation from Noel Harrison, a uh, great park historian here. I did some research, and John Hennessy on the Mysteries and Conundrums blog, the blog in the National Park Service, did a fantastic two-part article about Martha Stevens and talks a little bit about her. But down here, the Georgians will put themselves in not the best positions. A lot of people think this is a great position to be in. Yes, we have a stone wall. Yes, we have open fields in front of us. But if you're a Confederate soldier and you're here in 1862 and 30,000 Union soldiers take this road, what do you have to do? You have to go up these heights to try to get out of the way. And if you have to try to get out of this road, it's going to turn into no man's land. Looking at Andrew Russell's photograph from 2nd Fredericksburg, this can turn into a death trap very, very quickly. Frank, do you want to? Well, Chris has shown us the land, and he's shown us a really good Cree element of why it works. We not only have Confederate infantry in the sunken road who are using a stone wall for cover, Meanwhile, remember, Union soldiers are coming across vast open fields without any cover to speak of. But Chris just pointed out, we have a great big hill that backs up against the sunken road. So we have a Confederate front line, and we have a Confederate second line that on a flat map looked like a first and a second line. But in reality, we have two front lines. Everybody can shoot into this field at the same time. There are about 6,000 Confederates who can fire into this field. But there's only about 3,000 Union soldiers that can ever come forward at any given time. So, advantages with General Cobb. That's one of the few advantages here. One of the difficulties here is that if you're a commanding officer like General Cobb, 
this is still a deadly tricky location. At the height of the battle, General Cobb was one of the few fatalities to come out of this spot. He was hit by a shell very close to this very spot. It severed the femoral artery in his leg and he bled out in about 20 minutes. There was no commander in the sunken road, so they had to bring in another commander. A general named John Cook came in here. He wound up getting shot in the head. That's not good. So they had to bring in yet another commander, and that was a South Carolinian named Joseph Braver Kershaw. Kershaw, getting into the road, he wound up getting wounded too, getting shot in the arm. Truth is, of the, six, of the 22 brigade, regimental, and division commanders in our little sector here for the Confederates, 16 of them are gonna get hit. But Kershaw was unique because of all of the people who got hurt here, he stayed. He became the commander of this entire sunken road and his headquarters were right at Martha Stevens' house. And wouldn't it be cool if we could connect somehow with Joseph Kershaw just a little bit better? Chris, is there some way you have in mind that we might be able to get a little closer I, to Kershaw? I do, and I want to mention John, uh, John Cook. Um, he's a guy you don't stand beside in battle. He's wounded five times, so just stay away from him. I feel bad for everyone else. <laughs> Wayne, I want to uh, bring you up here yeah, Brett because and I will come in let's together. look at uh, <laughs> something that, that yeah. Brett and Wayne have. This is a fantastic piece. It would have been here 155 years ago right yeah. now. And, and whose sword is this? This is Joseph B. Kershaw's Model 1850 foot officer sword. And you can see his name inscribed in it right here. And Kershaw, of course, born in 1822, but he uh, got this sword in 1862. He's promoted to Brigadier General in February 1862. We have had this sword with Civil War Trust on the Antietam battlefield. We've had it at Gettysburg, at the Peach Orchard. <laughs> and now we've got it here at the Sunken Road. We passed it among the historians as we were walking, Chris, here on the Sunken Road. All of us got chills holding it here. And you can see the CS right on the hilt of it here. Uh, and it was made by Kraft Coldsmith and Kraft, which is the same sword maker that made swords uh, for Confederate officers, including Wade Hampton. And this sword was captured at the Battle of Sailor's Creek by an Ohio Cavalry soldier who got the Medal of Honor for capturing Kershaw's uh, headquarters flags. And we have a written account from General Kershaw describing that. And, and so, you, do, you, do you have any doubt about the, the tour here? So this sword has been going on a tour on Facebook Live. Yeah, 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 yeah. Had it been to any of those places since the battles where, where it not was originally? That, not that we know of. Not that we know of here. So this is the first time we know of that the sword is back onto the place where it actually uh, where it actually was and what a great you know what a great artifact piece of history so you know we're we're the partners that you all have for museum just like you preserving land we're preserving objects and we think that our understanding of the civil war greatly enhanced when we have objects like this that we can tell people about I, I, go ahead, sorry, I, I just wanted to add that, that we uh, behind the scenes from this morning we're standing on out in the cold they open up the back of this banner oh we brought this thing you might want to look at it i don't know if you want it here and it's like wait it's kershaw's sword he fought right here just up the street so yes we want that it was I, awesome and i would like to entertain from anybody here because we have a substantial entourage as, as you know if anybody wants to step up and say well, what does this do we take this out here okay it hasn't been here since but what does it do for our understanding about the civil war anyone want to step up oh here comes chris mikowski who wrote another book in the summer <laughs> i've been, I've been working, working <laughs> but what I think is really important about these artifacts is it reminds us these are people just like us. Like Kershaw was standing in this spot the way we are 155 years ago. This is what he has with him just as some of us have cameras, have our phones. This is an object that reminds us he's a person just like we are. And one of the things that I think is unfortunate about Civil War history is it becomes so mythologized that we forget these are people just like us doing their duty, doing what they think is right, going into some extraordinary circumstances, uh, and it just becomes hard for us to connect. And yet, look, this is something that, that he's basically got in his side pocket, just like the rest of us have. Like we say in the museum, Chris, you know, you can't, you can't Google this. Yeah. This is something that you can't get out of a book. You can't get in a classroom. You can only get in a museum, and we're happy to actually have it to interpret the history of the Civil War in the museum. And I know we, we looked up close, and you can see his name inscribed. And they're like, someone took a great deal of time to do that. Someone cared about this guy enough to take the time to do that and send that off. Um, that is amazing craftsmanship. Um, and so it's not just some name we're reading in a book, but like someone loved this guy, someone respected this guy, someone really admired this guy. And a lot of people today respect and admire this guy, Joseph <laughs> B. Kershaw. He is everywhere and a capable officer. 
um, as we go. Uh, Chris, we moving on? I want to thank Wayne uh, for bringing everything on. Brent, uh, we, this is great. The Dane, National Civil War, and Dane. Dane's over there, yeah. uh, National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Please check out their website, go over to the museum. And now we have one piece of uh, the puzzle that was here at Fredericksburg. Let's go and see another witness to the battle uh, down at one of the last standing structures on the Fredericksburg battlefield. And while we're headed over there, I know people are going to be curious about, you know, uh, did, did Union soldiers get right here? How close were they to the wall, if you care to address that as well? I know I've seen uh, varying evidence, and I'll bring Beth and Pete up here. I've seen one brigade claim they made it to within 12 paces of the wall, which I find maybe hard to believe. 50 yards seems to be about the closest that most make. What do you uh, both think? I'd say 50 yards. That's about the the um, closest I've seen. I think what's more, or what's most interesting to me is how important it is for folks to say, hey, I got closest, or forget those New Hampshire guys, we got closer. <clears throat> that, that the judge of bravery and distance to the wall are the same. It's a badge of honor. Oh, there were officers who would literally, you know, write uh, who the, the, the officers who supervised the burial details, you know, which units did you observe um, as you buried the dead, you know, on their cap badges and on their um, insignia that you saw were, were closest. So that was an important thing. I think another thing to keep in mind, though, too, is that when we talk about these, how close they got, it's probably not a cohesive fighting force at that point. It's probably the color guard, uh, maybe an officer, too. It's not the entire unit maybe getting that point. It's a few a few individuals. But I, and I want to throw, oh, go ahead. I throw something in there. Uh, a shout out to Ryan Quinn. Quint, who's a seasonal ranger here at Fredericksburg, is part of Emerging Civil War. Uh, Ryan put a great post up in honor of 155th Fredericksburg, a very thought-provoking post to me, talking about Lee's assault at Gaines's Mill versus here at uh, Burnside at Fredericksburg, talking about how it's all glorious at Gaines's Mill, but Burnside out here at this grand charge is called idiocy. So there's a great juxtaposition. You know, the Union Army is doing the same exact thing. They're uh, attacking. Uh, sustaining severe losses. So why is there a different stigma? So that's something to think about. Why is Burnside always the idiot and Leach goes to Pickett's charge and he goes to Gaines's mill and that's always glorious. So just think about that for a minute. I think that's really interesting. It's not like the people standing here today have some sort of a um, like a, a monopoly on being able to think about this stuff, write about this stuff, or make discoveries about this stuff. So you all watching this video are absolutely able to use the same sources that any, any of these other historians and maybe you'll crack the code on some of our numerous millions literally, of Civil War mystery. So let me encourage you to get involved. Don't be passive. I encouraged you earlier to have a Civil War buddy. Um, do that. It's no fun to do it alone and dive into the records. You're watching Civil War Trust Fredericksburg 155 Live. Uh, it's the anniversary right now. Here We're here with a bunch of people at the Sunken Road, and we've got more to see. Chris? So, Pete, I want to bring you up over sure. here. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this little white structure that's behind us, this little white house? Yeah, so um, this was standing here 155 years ago. Um, it was actually built before the Civil War, and uh, as you can see, there are little evidence of bullet uh, de battle damage left on the house. Um, now, this would have been right in between the lines, so it would have attracted a lot of, uh, well, did attract fire. I guess fire went through this house. We don't really think it was used too much uh, during the battle. It's not going to protect anybody. It's a wooden structure. Uh, you're not going to be uh, shielded by a bullet from it. Um, so, ah, nice photograph. So, um, I think one thing that really is important to reinforce here is that all along we've been talking about how this battle is fought in the midst of a community of 5,000 people. We don't want to lose sight of the fact that there are everyday folks who get wrapped up in this and they did not sign up to join the army. They didn't expect any of that. They got some big decisions they have to make, like are you going to stay or are you going to leave? And then when the battle destroyed, or are you going to continue to live in this place or are you going to go somewhere else? And in Fredericksburg, the majority of the folks did not remain here. A lot of them moved away. Fredericksburg was down to about 1,000 inhabitants by the time the Civil War was over. Many of those were formed once. Yeah, we're going to head inside. Too. Frank, I want to uh, bring you up here just for a second. I, I noticed some bullet holes, and we're on the Confederate side. They seem to be on the uh, wrong side of the building. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this is one of the um, controversial stories of the Sunken Road. Everybody thinks that the Confederate defense here was flawless. In fact, it's the perfect defense, they say. It's almost like the Gibraltar of the South. It's unassailable. But it does have problems, and one of the problems you're looking at right here, it's friendly fire. Those bullets don't come from the Union Army, they come from behind you, from the rest of the Confederate line on top of Marie's Heights. Of all the units that were pos positioned along the sunken road, the unit that suffered the highest casualties were the folks located right here. Now they had a house stopping a lot of the bullets coming through to them. But even if bullets did manage to come through, they still had a stone wall behind you that would have protected them. 
So they should have been the most protected people on the battlefield, and yet they had the highest casualties because these are the bullets that went high. Others went a lot lower and hit right in the Confederate line itself. Yeah, let's take a, a step up inside. This is uh, uh, the National Park Service. This is not normally open to the public. The Park Service has opened this for us. It's a little echoey in here, so we understand that already for those who like to complain about our sound. Oh, uh, our, our members, our watchers would never do anything like that. Uh, never. Continue, please. Uh, and Pete, can you uh, point out uh, a little bit about uh, the restoration of this house? And it was lived in up until the 1970s, am I correct? Correct, yeah. There was, uh, this was a residence, the, the last uh, resident of this place had a, a TV antenna on the top, and there was uh, electricity installed here, but no running water. She didn't want to move out, but uh, got increasingly concerned about all the visitors who would knock on her door and peek in her windows. So eventually, when the Park Service acquired this, uh, they really didn't have any idea that this in interior wall had never really been patched up or repaired, they just had put wallpaper over top of all these bullet holes, because that was probably the cheapest, cheapest, most expedient way to go ahead and cover this all up. And like I said, these people in Fredericksburg, you know, they're going to try to go ahead and keep living in their houses, but do it in a way where they're not going to have to put out a lot of money. So, so when you look at this, a few things to think about. One is the effect that a 58 caliber uh, bullet can have on a piece of wood. Imagine what that would do uh, to a soldier. So uh, hence, we, we'll talk about the amputations and all. You'll notice that a lot of these um, holes are angled. So because the battle is essentially going this way, they're slicing through here at an angle. A uh, Union soldier down in the swale trying to pick off a Confederate artillerist up here, maybe, you know, uh, doesn't line up just right and it goes through here. But if this is any indication of what the exterior of this house will look like when the battle was over, just remember this is an interior wall that's not even facing the main axis of combat. The outside would have just been shredded. The people in Fredericksburg in Northern Virginia are being affected by the Civil War in a very real way. A lot of people think this only happened in the Deep South, you know, the civilian population. No, this is as far up as you can get in the Confederacy, and here in Fredericksburg, you know, there's a very big impact on these civilians. Yeah, I, I think that uh, a couple estimates that I saw was Martha Stevens, her house had, uh, according to one account, 2,500 bullet holes in it. Uh, some said 2,000, some said 1,000. Uh, Martha Stevens is a lady who allegedly stayed here during the time of the battle, though we don't have any soldiers talking about her here. I don't think she had a basement to hide in, so if there's 2,500 bullets shooting through your house, I'm not quite sure you're staying there. Yeah. But she does have a monument out along the Sunken Road, right across the street from someone we know who was here, and that's Thomas Cobb, who's mortally wounded in that area. Uh, this is a, a building that's not normally open, so we want to thank the National Park Service for yeah. opening this up for us. Behind Dan, you can see some more shell damage. Uh, the Park Service does a great job of, of exposing some of the, the walls so you can still see what it would look like here. The door's been shot up. Up above Pete's head, it's a little dark to see, but inside of the rafters, there's mini balls still stuck up in there. So this was a house that saw a great portion of two different battles. The Union Army will fight here again in May of 1863. Uh, Chris Mikowski and I have uh, found a great diary of a soldier who was killed just out the window right beside uh, where Dan is filming uh, as he is attacking towards uh, the Innes house here in May of 1863. I think about this house being at the center of that very intense fight at Second Fredericksburg, where the hand-to-hand -hand fighting is going, and they literally broke through across the wall right out here. Sewell Gray, the officer uh, that, that Chris is mentioning from Maine, um, is shot down as he's leading his men literally over the wall. So it's very, uh, very poignant. But to think about how much lead must have been in the air at both of those battles that you've got stuff in a perpendicular wall that is perforated like that. Incredible. Which brings up another point. These guys were tremendously bad shots. <laughs> Don't ever buy into the fact that these guys are crack shots going off to war. Everybody in America owned a gun. Everybody was in the backwoods. These are city boys who didn't even know how to load a rifle sometimes. So the tendency was to shoot high. I've been told by another friend historian, he saw an account after the war of a study that was done and he said it took an average of 140 pounds of lead to kill one man in the American Civil War. That's a lot of shooting. And hey, let me just say, uh, we, we, we're, we're gonna finish up for now, at least with the sunken road, although we'll be back to it. We're gonna check out Maurice Heights. We're gonna check out the cemetery. Before we do, you gotta talk about what we see behind you. And by the way, let me just say this to you, you all. We have no idea what some of these comments are uh, uh, on the feed here. So uh, if someone wants to explain it, that's fine. If not, let's stick to what's going on here. Um, that is the Civil War. Um, American history, the Battle of Fredericksburg, and things like that. So um, we want to talk a little about Richard Kirkland a little bit in brief, and also uh, you know thank our friends at the National Civil War Museum. And there's a reason why we will do that. Who's coming up? 
Oh, well, three people come up. <laughs> Everyone come up. Beth, come on sure. in here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm talking about Richard Kirkland? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so Richard Kirkland is one of the most fascinating stories on this battlefield because it has one of the most prominent monuments. Everyone comes to see him and talks about him. And Richard Kirkland is actually, to me, the epitome of what people want to remember about the battle. So come on back in here, and there we want go. to say something to our friends at the National Civil War uh, Museum. So come on up here, uh, Wayne, Brett, and Dane. Uh, and, and, and Dane, come on up here because, My you know, crew. if I'm correct, <laughs> Richard Kirkland is, you know, honored at your museum in Harrisburg. That's right. When they built the museum and opened it in 2001, sculptor Terry Jones, who comes from eastern Pennsylvania, put up a likeness of Richard Kirkland and the soldier that he's administering to is a soldier in the 127 Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment, one of the units that was here. And that soldier and that unit, those folks came from Hummelstown, Pennsylvania, right near where the National Civil War Museum is located. And we think it's such a, a great testimony to what we do at the museum because it's, as Chris mentioned, the human side of the Civil War. We want to tell stories about people that were involved in the Civil War, all parts of it, and we want to connect to people through those stories and I want to thank Brad and Dane of our staff and all of you we were honored to be with you Gary uh, for the National Civil War Museum come and see us up in Harrisburg Pennsylvania drive that 39 miles uh, uh, north uh, up to see us at the museum and I, I know you won't be disappointed come see us on January 17th when we open our new Civil War photography exhibit because Gary Edelman is going to be the speaker that's right that's uh, not the only reason of course but for that but you guys thank you I don't know of another museum that would come and bring these priceless artifacts out so thank you so much guys for doing this we're going to see you again before long as we establish our slate for 2018 put on here what you want us to do but especially if they're 155th things um think maybe things like we've been getting comments about uh vicksburg and chancellorsville and uh, uh gettysburg and chickamauga what else is there well, we'll try to do, uh, of course <laughs> kelly's ford march 1863 uh dan davis is celebrating back there a cavalry guy in itself uh, uh so thank you guys and then what i'm going to do because we lost some connectivity is bring beth back up here in case they didn't hear it, but okay. this time you have 45 seconds to tell us about Richard Kirkland. All right. No, no pressure, right? So Richard <laughs> Kirkland, we already took a look at his monument from a distance here. Uh, you can see it's essentially a young man bending over a wounded soldier and giving him some water. And what makes this so compelling is that Richard Kirkland uh, is actually, or was, on this side of the wall, administering to wounded Union soldiers. So he's actually going out to help his enemy. And it's an act of compassion that... Um, while we can't necessarily 100% confirm, it's something that really resounds with people because we, we'd really rather think about the humanity and the compassion that people share for each other, uh, sort of what brings us together despite the war, uh, as opposed to all of the slaughter that had taken place the previous day on December 13th. Good, good. Thank you, Beth. That was excellent. Uh, she rose to the challenge. Don Fons has something to add. Uh, Beth was using Richard Kirkland to talk about the compassion uh, that could be found here on the battlefield. And there was a lot of that, but there was also a lot of callousness. Uh, these soldiers had been in battle many times, and they'd kind of grown a little bit hard to the suffering and death. And uh, that's kind of uh, uh, highlighted by the, the pillaging of the bodies that took place here in the aftermath of the December 13th fighting. Uh, a fellow named John Trowbridge came to Fredericksburg after the battle and was talking with one of the local people. And the fellow made an interesting comment. He said, you see the battlefield here? He said, uh, it's very interesting because it, 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 during the battle, it was four different colors. It was brown, it was blue, it was white, and it was red. And Trowbridge uh, looked at him like, what do you mean? And he said, well, when the battle started, it was, a, it was just dirt field, so it was brown. Then, uh, after the battle, the Union soldiers carpeted the, uh, the battlefield, so it turned blue. Uh, a day later, the Confederates had gone out and pillaged the uh, Union soldiers of their, of their uh, uniforms, so they now were down to their white underclothing. And then day after that, people had gone out and taken the white underclothing, so now they just had the, the red naked bodies out there. So uh, there was a lot of callousness in addition to some compassion. Okay, good. Now, so what we're going to do is walk up toward this, our special access. We're going to go up to a place called Brompton, and I see we're going to be surrounded by stone walls, which usually does not mean good connectivity. Hang with us for a second. On the way up, we're going to talk a little bit more, and we're also going to take care of some of you people that are just totally disrupting our feed. So don't, don't pay attention to those comments. We have no idea what they mean, but you won't see them for long. Chris? I just want to add, um, we're going to head up to some private property. This is a special access only, so we ask you don't go up onto their lawn or up to their door where we're heading to. Also, with the Kirkland Memorial, I like to point out that that was placed here in 1965, and it's designed by Felix de Weldon. Uh, the sculpture might look a little bit similar, 
If you've been to Arlington National Cemetery or to the, Qua uh, the gates of Quantico, you would see the Iwo Jima Memorial, the Marine Corps Memorial. He also designed that that sits in Arlington National Cemetery in the smaller version out at the Marine Corps Base Quantico. So we're going to head up towards Brompton. All right, good. So here we go. We might lose you, so we're going to walk fast. All right, we're going to hand the camera off, see what we can do there. So Brompton, of course, um, is uh, also known as the Marie House, also the house atop Marie's Heights. It's the one you've always seen in the distance. We'll get up there as quickly as we can while Chris handles some administrative stuff. This is really nice. That's pointed out. Um, the original section of the stone wall is over here. So we'll do it on the so it looks like we still have coverage. So Chris is handling some administrative business. Um, Chris Mikowski and Beth were just mentioning that we, we passed by some of the original section of the stone wall, st stuff that hasn't been rebuilt. We'll check that out on the way down. But we're walking up here toward Brompton. Um, again, it was here during the battle. It was bullet riddled. And we're going to talk about that. Who's good on the Brompton house that we can get an, uh, an interlude on the way up? Who can intro uh, Brompton was built in 1824 by the Marie family. Um, John Marie is going to own the series of five hills that's known as Marie's Heights. Uh, and his son, Edward Marie, is actually in charge of the Fredericksburg Artillery. If you were joining us yesterday, you would have heard about the Fredericksburg Artillery. And they are um, this is the unit to fire the first shot in anger for the Confederates, the first artillery shot in anger. Cool. And uh, I've got lots of pictures, so let me just start showing them right away because I'm going to run out anyway. You can, I think, see the bullet-riddled nature um, of Brompton here um, very clearly as we go. <laughs> here we have some University of Mary Washington security uh, coming up. Thank you, kind Police. sir. <laughs> Police, sir, not security. Um, and you can just see how bullet-riddled the house is. And now we're actually getting to see that same part of the house to the left of the tree. You're seeing some of this, and the bullet damage is actually still visible on it. We want to be respectful up here. This is the uh, uh, house of the president of Mary Washington, and they've provided us access here um, today. So like Chris said, don't come up here, please, uh, without permission. Who's got more to say? What, well, I, I want to say for? something about the University of Mary Washington. Uh, they were integral for helping us today, but they also helped save the area where the Kirkland Memorial sits. Uh, at one time, the National Park Service didn't have a partner like the Civil War Trust, and the university stepped in to help uh, to purchase that land and block the construction of a couple apartment buildings. Correct, Frank? That's right. That's right. Good, good. Um, I'll ask, maybe you can talk more about it, but if you'll turn around and do a 180, Chris, we still won't be looking into the sun. Uh, we can see um, some there. civilians um, standing uh, right in front of the house. You can see the pillars are damaged and the house has really suffered the cold hand of war. Uh, this was not only here in 1862, but the Confederates are camping here. Then it's a giant Union hospital in 1864. And there, this is just used again and again and again, Frank. Absolutely. This is uh, the most iconic spot on the entire Fredericksburg battlefield. This is the one spot that everybody recognizes in photographs of the time, in sketches that are put, uh, put in all the newspapers, north and south. This becomes the eye of the storm. And as a result of that, this is the thing that makes everybody remember Fredericksburg as this end of the battlefield. You can see that the building is remarkably the same. The, uh, the top of it has been added since the time of the war. But uh, if you look very carefully, you'll still be able to see some of the battle damage on the facade. There's still a number of pockmarks over by the doors, near the windows, that you'll be able to see that uh, this still bears the scars of 155 years of history. Now, I notice in the picture, you can see some of the serious trenches uh, and earthworks up there, some of, w some of which remainders still um, are up here. But uh, a lot of the photos taken up here actually really focus on the hospital activities. If I'm correct, Frank, and anybody else, we're talking about May 1864. These are, you know, overland campaign wounded that are really brought back up here. And there's at least 10 pictures taken up here of wounded soldiers. Right. When it comes to the photography, people do have an experience with them. then you're looking at sketches, uh, battle sketches that were done with artists like Alfred Wood and uh, uh, Edwin Forbes types. But um, when it comes to actually documenting photographs here, then we have to point the war is once again revisited the Fredericksburg area. We've not, you've heard about the first battle of Fredericksburg with us for the last two days. You've heard about a second battle of Fredericksburg here today. There's a battle at Chancellorsville in spring of 1863. There's a battle in the wilderness in the spring of 1864. And then Spotsylvania Courthouse on top of that. This is the most fought over piece of ground on the entire North American continent. P places like Gettysburg, 
they host the war for three days and they feel that pinch for the rest of their existence. Places like Sharpsburg host the war for one bloody day and it leaves a tremendous mark on their psyche. Fredericksburg's unique as a community unlike any other, and this is indicative of it. The war came here and it stayed. It stayed here for years. And as a result, it left a blight on the landscape. Some of it, people can build, rebuild, move on with their lives, but the scars will always remain. Yeah, and I, I see somebody catered a party here. I, I'm glad they did. They say that there's two kitchens in the house. Very interesting as well. Um, I also think that Frank just called Antietam and Gettysburg positively cute little engagements. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that's what I just got from that because I'm very sensitive about it. Um, I want to note that some of these pictures, we're going to make our way over to the other side of the house soon. But, you know, some of these photos show, um, you know, some of the wounded soldiers. And I swear we have an Asian American here. Um, some of you might be familiar with another photo I think I'm going to show next or soon, um, uh, which is actually entitled wounded Indians um, at Fredericksburg. You can't see it too well, but uh, I think Eric Mink or somebody on the park blog has identified some of these guys as some sharpshooters in a in the Michigan, Michigan, Michigan sharpshooter Michigan. unit. Yeah, so go Michigan over there. I didn't mean the University of Michigan. I meant Michigan State and the state of Michigan, of course. Um, this is taken up here somewhere as well. And if you're uh, looking for the band hammer, it is coming down. It's not Gary, it's Chris, and it's going to keep coming. So keep uh, if you keep putting them up, they're keep coming down. So if you want to, if you want to get banned, keep talking about couches and all sorts of other things like that. So um, that's great. You look forward to it. Now I've got a photo that I think I want to show that shows this oak tree here um, that we're coming up to. So here's a photo. You can see the house in the background here. That's Brompton there, and here's a giant oak tree. Even in 1864, it's a giant oak tree, and that's that tree right over there. It's still there. Well, Fresnito um, worked on this in his great Grant and Lee book. In that photo, you can blow it up and actually see the photographic uh, uh, developing box where this uh, photo and all these photos up here, a lot of them, were actually developed. That's pretty cool stuff in itself. And when you come on up over here, I just want to show you all because you have a close-up view of wounded actually right up at Brompton. So I would like to line this up if we can. Who wants to say something about Brompton or the hospitals here or anything on the way over? We've got a brain trust. Let's hear it. Well, one of the things you have to keep in mind with Brompton is that while it's a marvelous edifice, it's also a liability on the battlefield because it's located on the top of Marie's Heights, it's silhouetted against the sky, and it's a fixed target that everybody can range their weapons on. Of all the Confederate and Union units that fought around us, of all the Union and Confederate units that fought around us, the unit that had the single highest loss of commanding officers was the unit positioned right in front of the house. Wow. The 3rd South Carolina Infantry went through seven commanding officers in about seven minutes. In fact, they fell in such rapid succession that one of the wounded officers had to resume command before he could be evacuated to a safer locale. So when we think about the Confederates here, of course they beat back wave after wave of Union attackers. Of course they have a marvelous position, but it does come with a price tag. No battlefield is easy. And this is one of those tough, tricky places on the battlefield, simply because the house makes an easy target. Cool, so check this out here. I mean, you can learn a lot by this. Not only can you sort of travel through time, but look at this. Just a beautiful view. You can count your windows if you'd like. It looks like they added another window or changed that structure somehow up there, but this is absolutely right here. You're looking right at the side of the house, and here you have wounded soldiers from the wilderness or Spotsylvania um, or something right around that time laid out here. We have other pictures showing them over there and over there and over there, so we know that they're just wounded all over Marie Heights, and not just in the areas that were photographed. That's how battlefields are. They're not just in one place. It's where the photographer happens to be that we get to visualize, but man, there are wounded all over the place in this massive, bloodiest campaign of the Civil War. Uh, Connor, are you coming up for a question or anything? Okay, good. Well, I think we're going to make our way down. Let's cut by the house here, and we're going to head on down um, toward it. You're watching the Civil War Trust Fredericksburg 155 Live. Thanks so much for joining us, and Connor does have a question. Okay, David asks, are you near some of the earthworks up there on the hill? Are we near some of the earthworks up on the hill? Um, as far as I know, we were just closest to them. They're right on the brow, and I think we'd have to go downward. Uh, any thought on that? Right here on the crest. Oh, if, I can kind uh, of see it. I can get Chris to just pan over towards the city, right here on the crest in front of us, where you see one big tree that stands out above the others directly in front of us, there's a line of earthworks right at the crest and, itself. And you can see a little undulation right, I can't quite get my finger in the right spot, right about there. 
Um, you can see a little undulation of land, and that's some remnant as well. And these would have changed in 62 versus 63 versus 64. Right. In fact, the truth of 1862 is there weren't any earthworks up here at the time of the fighting on December 13th. After the fighting has ceased for the day, darkness descends, everything calms down. That's when the Confederates realize this was not an easy place to hold on to. So that's when they started to dig in. So if you saw this and at this time of day, 155 years ago, you would have seen Confederates sitting on the crest where we are, staring down into a big open vast valley, but no cover for the Confederates up here. The great irony of all this is that the closer the Confederates get to the Union Army, getting to the bottom of the hill into a sunken road where there's a stone wall, the safer they get. It's counterintuitive. You would think that the further you get away from your enemy, the safer you would be. But in this case, it's the other way around. You have to get closer to them to get cover. Okay, good. So does anybody want to talk about what we can see from here? Because this is that rare moment, because you usually can't come up here, that we can actually look. Look, I see the courthouse, or, or, or uh, and, and I see the Episcopal Church. I can see uh, Stafford Heights in the distance. What, just to, anybody want to give a quick summary? Don't be shy, guys. So, you know I'm about zoomed this in stuff. on the courthouse. It's a little blurry. <laughs> and then you can see the top of the Presbyterian Church in St. George's Episcopal. Uh, Don? Yeah, if you look just beyond the uh, courthouse, you can see a, a modern uh, radio tower. And that would have been where the Phillips House was. Uh, where, so that's where Burnside uh, viewed the battle from. That's actually on Stafford Heights Very itself. Very cool. Good. So, I mean, so is that, is that, are you telling me that Chatham isn't on Stafford Heights? The Stafford Heights sort of behind? Crest. Not on the crest. Okay, very, very cool. I never knew that. Um, keep hitting us with your questions. Um, and thanks to everybody who's joining us here today. What do you got, Don? You can see some of the uh, bullet and shell damage. Uh, Watch out for the sun coming up here. Picture, let's, picture let's a little bit earlier. I kind of showed this side of the house. And uh, you can still see uh, a lot of the damage, even now. Yeah, more of an ample damage. And this is on the side of the house. This isn't even on the front where the bullets were coming from. <laughs> exactly. So similar to the Innis house situation there. Um, all right, we're going to beat a hasty uh, um, walk down uh, toward the sunken road. So let's kind of tie this up because we're going to be moving this into cemetery and other things. So, you know, what ultimately happens? The Confederates, they're going to suffer some casualties. The Union's going to suffer a lot more. Let's recapitulate and, and talk about this here. Well, sure. Um, so as the battle progresses and you have these attacks launched throughout the better part of the day, uh, as we said, no one really gets too close to the wall itself. The um, Confederate artillery here really has their day. Um, for me, Marie's Heights means artillery. The sunken road is the infantry position. The heights themselves are where the Confederate uh, kind of mastered the ground with their guns. And uh, those were laid out ahead of time. Like we said, this is a prepared battlefield. Uh, Edward Porter Alexander was in charge of placing some of the guns on Marie's Heights. And uh, he actually went against Lee's advice. Before the battle began, uh, Porter Alexander talked about uh, putting the guns uh, kind of forward on the edge of the crest, um, more like the military crest, so they could go ahead and master the open plain. Well, Lee comes by and basically says that Porter Alexander has made a mistake and he should move the guns back to the very top of the hill to go ahead and be able to do counter battery fire with the guns on the other side of the river. Well, Alexander doesn't want that. He wants to be able to control the plane for the infantry assault. So he disobeys Lee and keeps those guns forward. And that turned out to be very fortuitous for the Confederates. After the battle was over, Alexander also says that he made that point very vocally in a meeting of a lot of Confederate officers, and uh, Lee did not dignify that comment with a response. But, um, <laughs> but as the day went on, the Confederates, because they had you know, scoped out all these uh, spots on the field, they were able to go ahead and control this ground. It was a very dramatic moment uh, towards the uh, uh, onset of evening when the guns were running out of ammunition and they had to be pulled back and replaced with fresh guns. And that was just about the time that the Pennsylvania Division of Andrew Humphreys uh, was launching an attack. And for a while, Union troops coming across the plain didn't come under any artillery fire. Hold so, on real quick, just get your view, because we don't want to lose connectivity of the original stone wall over there. So that's part of the original um, that you can see. Continue, Pete, I'm oh, so really? sorry to break oh, no up. Worries. It's the, the actual worries. sunken portion of the road. And this is where we also had trouble with our connectivity. So continue, and I know yes. Chris is also at, uh, chomping at the bit. I was just going to mention that intersection we just passed through a lot of folks wonder about the Irish Brigade. They had come straight up that road, um, just past the brick house that was down that road. So if folks are looking for spots on the uh, on the battlefield, looking for landmarks, that's one of the more famous stories from there. Doug Oldman, we made sure that Chris Mikowski <laughs> talked about the Irish Brigade just for you. <laughs> Excellent.
Um, okay, so what are we doing now? I think, Beth, it's time to bring you up here. We're climbing a height. Is this Marie's Heights? Is this some sort of a different hill? Uh, I, set us up? I just want to add, we've left private property. We're now back on park service land. Right, so if you're taking our trail, please walk up this way um, <laughs> for the park. Uh, yeah, so we're climbing up at actually a section of Marie's Heights. So um, the Marie home we just saw at Brompton, but now we're climbing up a section called uh, Willis Hill. And so as we actually head toward the National Cemetery, we'll pass by a private cemetery, the Willis Family Cemetery, uh, because this place, much like the rest of most battlefields, was a home, a private home before uh, the battle. But all of this, uh, sort of the far ranging heights beyond town, is actually Marie's Heights. This is actually a very long um, set of hills. Cool. I just want to say I'm happy to have Phil Spoggy on here. You know, we've been talking about ways to connect with the Civil War, about maps, photos, the battlefield itself, and artifacts. But here's another way, historic weaponry. So maybe check out the North-South Skirmish Association where they live fire at special events. And if you hear the whiz of a Civil War bullet, man, does that per comport with the accounts that you've read about the whiz of Civil War bullets on there. Go to one of these events one time, put it on your bucket list, and maybe you'll want to participate or something like that. Just anything you can do to drag the past forward and experience um, what they did safely I hope smell what they smelled do what they did taste what they tasted things like that to the degree that we can so we have a little debate about where Lee's headquarters was on the battlefield uh, some people say it's here some people say it's there it sits up on a place called Telegraph Hill at the time of the battle yeah. today it's on Lee's Hill uh, aptly named after him so that's where his headquarters would have been Jackson will be on the south end of the field overseeing everything essentially from the Prospect Hill area and then James Longstreet would have been up into his sector here along Marie's Heights. I think we just heard from the headquarters hammer. Um, get, let me, let, I want to show a picture here real quick if I can find it uh, and don't let me mess it up if I can't. So we're going to get up there but I wanted to show one particular picture. Here's another one of those 1863 Russell pictures. Um, this is after he took a picture in the sunken road. He went and crested Marie's Heights and found this sad scene on the back with a uh, looks like a wagon or maybe even a limber um, that has been damaged and I'm pretty sure that's uh, Herman Haupt um, the railroad Civil War guy I'm sure that's his exact title um, and uh, and you can see some dead horses right over there it's my understanding this photo was taken just about 300 yards behind the camera is that right Chris yeah it's about about that far from here where we are Oh, yeah, it's all the rangers far. agree it's exactly 300 yeah. yards um, behind the camera over here. It is here. not far. Yeah, hard to access, <laughs> not far. Okay, and let's keep going here. So, uh, Beth, come on back up here and tell us a little bit more about what's going on up here. Sure, so actually a lot of what Pete has just told us about the artillery is very appropriate as we come up here. Um, speaking of scene restoration, one of the neat things that we've been able to do just in the last couple years is remove a, a large white house that stood just off um, to our right. Uh, which you now see is just empty, restored, essentially to almost what the heights look like, although again remembering there were houses up here um, during the battle. But also if you take a look at the sort of ledge terrace around it, we'll be able to see this better as we uh, follow the trail around. Um, we believe that the construction, the post-war construction of that house actually incorporated some of the earthworks that had been built around the, um, the artillery, around the guns, were incorporated into the terraces that were used. So, you know, Fredericksburg citizens uh, basically making the best of their situation. Very That's cool. It. And you said there were some houses up here. I'm not sure if any of you all can help with this, but I wanted to turn this corner so we could show this photo. 1864, I believe, um, up on Marie's Heights. So the sunken road would be below us off to the left, and you can see the mass damage on top of the hill. You can see substantial earthworks here by 1864. Do you, does anybody know which sort of structures are on the right here uh, with the brain trust we have here? If not, I'm going to start to make up some family names. Here comes Frank. <laughs> Well, you're right in the heart of uh, Willis Hill, and uh, the Willis family buildings were uh, a nice little complex of buildings, several of them directly ahead of us, and uh, many of them served as observation points for the Washington Artillery of New Orleans. Those buildings were whitewashed just before the battle, uh, so they looked really nice and sharp, as you can see in the, in the photographs here. But they got hit so many times during the course of December 13th, the white paint literally was chipped off. There was nothing but red brick left behind. It made a stark contrast from being pristine and white at the beginning of the day to being blood red by the end of the day. So all of this area would have been under intense shell fire over the course of this hour and many of the hours that had preceded us today and right up till sunset on December 13th. So of all the places on the battlefield, one of the critical areas for the Confederates 
is the significance of having artillery on this hilltop, but fire begets fire. So where you have a linchpin like the Washington artillery, you also have a tremendous amount of fire that's gonna be coming at them. This entire crest is gonna be chewed up. It's a good thing that the Confederates decided to dig in on the crest because it's a huge controversy at where they place their guns. Most artillery positions would have been placed back further along the ridge and not anywhere near the crest itself. Being on the crest, they were gonna be silhouetted and they would have had all the troubles that we saw with the troops that were around Brompton itself. You can see that this is a big open space that Chris has just panned on. Now, here at the crest, this is the artillery that wants to take advantage of that. They're gonna dominate all of the landscape below Marie's Heights. And they wanted to interplay with every last yard that they could. So if they had been pushed back by regulation, by Robert E. Lee's only prescription, they would have only been able to hit the edge of the city and those that were just exiting the city. But an artillerist named E. Porter Alexander, one of the great heroes of the Confederate artillery units, he's the one who determined that he wanted the guns up here at the crest. Now, as you look at this terrace immediately behind me, this is a feature that was added to the landscape after the battle. But I'll tell you a little secret about it. This is part of the battle as well, because this terrace that was created started with the formation on this little corner where you see it rounded. This was a gun pit in 1862. So the Washington artillery would have had a firing position right here. Later on, when somebody decided to build a house on the hilltop, rather than tear out all the gun pits, they filled in all the gun pits and created that artificial terrace. So you are looking at a Civil War feature that has been turned into a modern feature over time. The gun pits themselves were a huge controversy because the engineers who laid them out did it by regulations and kept them very low so that the guns could fire at any angle over top of them. When the artillerists got here and realized that they had this wide open space in front of them, they salivated at the prospect, but they also were afraid that everybody could take a shot at them too. So they started to build the dirt up on top of the gun pits for their own safety. The engineers were really upset about that and proceeded to come back, demand that they take the dirt away. This was such a huge hullabaloo up here that it went all the way to James Longstreet. And his decision was, if it was gonna save one finger, What's the difference? It's the artillerists that have to fight here, not the engineers, so the dirt stayed. <laughs> cool. Frank had mentioned that there had been a house here, so folks who have come to the, uh, the battlefield the past few years may have remembered a big old house that had been here. It's part of landscape restoration back in 2014. That it's almost as if Chris was Mikowski raised. was reading our comments. <laughs> <laughs> that house was raised to recreate this wartime appearance. And earlier I had mentioned coming up here so that you could see what things looked like. And again, it's hard to visualize that 900 yards of open space because of the neighborhood down here, but you'll agree that it's absolutely worth coming up here to really understand this perspective that Frank has talked about so much. Think about that wide open vista down there, a couple houses dotting things here and there. You would have been able to see the canal across there and aim your cannons right at those stripped down bridges. Uh, it was absolutely a stunning landscape. You can only get a taste of it today. But again, that's why preservation is so important so that we can save these landscapes and recreate them and better understand these classrooms. Absolutely worth the walk up here. Let's take a walk over to the National Cemetery because I think there's a great poignant place for us to wrap up today's story. You know, I want to point out the uh, smaller cemetery just in the uh, kind of sunlight back there. That is uh, the Willis Cemetery. Um, if we had more time, we'd run over to it. There's a lot of battle damage on it. Feel free to uh, make your way to Fredericksburg. Come to Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Wilderness, Spotsylvania. Get out here, walk the ground, and take a look at the Willis Hill Cemetery. Good. Well spoken. It sounds like you've said that before, Chris. <laughs> Once so or twice. We're approaching over to the <laughs> National Cemetery. We're going to take a very quick uh, trip inside here. Not only because it's a beautiful view, but it's beautiful terrace. Maybe we can take a look at the quick picture before we get in. As I ask Don Fonts to come back up, give us a re-intro, and we'll check out a couple of cool things along the way. Don? Well, as we mentioned before, there were a lot of thousands of dead uh, Union soldiers uh, buried throughout the uh, landscape here in Fredericksburg area after the war. 
and uh, ultimately over a period of three years a group of men called the Burial Corps collected all these bodies and brought them here to uh, Fredericksburg burying them all in one spot. Initially it was a very functional place, uh, simply a place to get the bodies off the field. Everything in the cemetery back when it was first built was made out of wood. Wooden headboards, uh, wooden lodges, wooden fences. Uh, everything was wooden, but that caused the problem. Be that caused the problem because, as you know, wood rots. And so within five, six, seven years, all, not only this cemetery, but cemeteries throughout the country who had been built at the same time, all were in need of replacement. So the Army at that point decided to bite the bullet uh, to put in, uh, to rebuild the cemeteries using permanent materials. And so today we now have brick walls, a stone cemetery, and headstones as opposed to headboards. This is one of the largest Civil War cemeteries you will find in the country. It also has the largest number of unknown Civil War dead. Um, so uh, two questions people are asking if the trees are witness trees, if they're all modern, and how do you get a tour uh, with Frank O'Reilly? Perhaps Frank can answer that one or, or other ones. Um, I know he plays hard to get because he is hard to get. So let's walk on around into the cemetery, come back on up here. Don, do you know anything about the trees? Are they all new trees at the base of the hill? Uh, well, see? All, all the trees in the cemetery are, are post-war trees. Okay. Uh, the armies had camped in this area throughout the winters, and they cut down almost all of the trees. But uh, one of the things they did after they got all the bodies in here was they then moved to stage two, which was basically beautifying the cemetery. They wanted these places to be not only places of burial, but places of remembrance. And so in the uh, late 1800s, um, they then brought in thousands of trees, many more than are here today, uh, and turned this place almost into a forest. But over the years, disease and cold weather and other things have taken their toll. So we really have many fewer trees now than there was back 100 years ago. All right, cool. So, I mean, this, this cemetery is a lot bigger than, say, Gettysburg and some of this. This is one of the bigger ones. So um, how does this cemetery differ from other national cemeteries? I know sometimes, you know, they usually have the bivouac and the dead poem and the text of the Gettysburg. Address. What's special about the cemetery? How does it differ? Well, again, all, all these cemeteries were all done by the same organization at the same time. And so they are, do have many similar characteristics. One way this is a little bit different is we have different types of headstones because the headstones uh, were made before they, they began regulating uh, that, that feature of the cemetery. So today we have basically two types of Civil War headstones. We have uh, the, um, the uh, more slab type headstones like you see here. These are for known soldiers and if you look at each of these uh, stones you'll actually see a name and a state uh, of the soldier where that soldier came from. However, uh, most of the headstones in the cemetery are not of that type, but are of the smaller variety, small square headstones. These represent the unknown soldiers, which comprise, uh, in this case, about 84% of those buried here in the cemetery. Uh, this one has only one soldier in it, but it, if you go around the cemetery and look at some other ones, let's see if we can find one here. We happen to be in a section where it's only all. Don, come on over this way. We're getting better connectivity. Okay. Here we go. You look at this one, you see that number down below is a four. That means four soldiers, all unknown, are buried in this uh, one plot. And there are places in the cemetery where there are as many as 12 soldiers buried in a single grave. Okay, good. Uh, here we are with a brain trust in the Fredericksburg National Cemetery with all sorts of people here. Um, we're, we're just finishing it up, but I would be really interested in seeing what you all have to add, if anything, at this point. Come on up here with our big entourage. Let's get, get all together for this thing. And yes, I'm going to take a selfie while we're doing it. Um, who, who has anything else to add as we finish up? We're not done yet. We have another live coming up as well. Here I've got one for the uh, Civil War nerd from Gettysburg for us, and that would be uh, Gary. The 127th PA has a monument up here. Their colonel, uh, Jennings, is also the same colonel who led the men out at Marsh Creek on June 26th at Gettysburg. All right, so, very cool. There's your Fredericksburg Gettysburg time. Yeah, and if you count that, uh, let's in do our our, battlefield we, we haven't done a quiz in this one, so we're going to do it really quick. We're going to step up by units as I point to you, so I'm going to start company. What's up next? Above company. Oh, uh, regiment. Battalion. Oh, wow. Brigade. <laughs> division. And here at Fredericksburg. Uh, Court. What at Fredericksburg? Grand Division. And Commander. <laughs> Commander Beth, all right, the Chancellor of Chancellorsville. There we go. Does anybody else have anything to add about the cemetery or otherwise? One last little blip. There's one monument in the park to Second Fredericksburg that's located here in the cemetery. At the far end, there's a monument to Parker's Battery. It was one of the Confederate units that was here. Um, so it's one way we can remember Second Fredericksburg. Okay, that's very, very cool. So, so there's no end, and I'm not kidding. You could study this one battle, Fredericksburg, for your entire life and still not run out of things to do. I think Frank could attest to that, by the way. I just heard during this 
just walked it. If you want to get a tour with Frank O'Reilly, write to your congressman. Um, he'll petition a few other ones. Maybe you'll get out on the battlefield with him or just watch these Facebook Lives as you go. Um, Chris White has been an awesome soldier with the camera doing this this whole time. And Connor Townsend, Chris Bukowski, Dan Davis, Don Fonz, Frank O'Reilly, Pete Mogul, and Beth Parnixa. Thank you all so much uh, for helping us today. We still got one other cool stop to go. Chris, will you preview that real quick? We'll be heading down to uh, Washington Avenue and talking about the battle from that perspective and visiting the city slash Confederate cemetery. Very, very cool. Make sure you come out for that. We're going to um, have a smaller entourage, but uh, we'll be able to answer all your questions down there. Thank you so much for watching on our longest ever Facebook Live event. Tell us what you'd like to see in the future. And above all, you know you're sick of me saying it. Thanks for supporting Battlefield Preservation.